Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Jack Pendle. I'm the engineering director for Volker Rail uh, for the next 23 days anyway. Um, I retire uh, this, this year after 54 years in the industry, so I think I've done my stint. Um, I want to talk to you today about the, the m and &E networking group, which is something that over the years has been a big part of my life. Um, having been the first chair of the m and &E networking group in April 1994, and the current chair, although it's not been continuous. So, pre-privatisation, um, big yellow plant and, and most of the plant was, was owned by British Rail. And here we've got the, uh, the good old coming and going sign on a, uh, an old Placer EPV 360 excavator, which uh, was uh, part of the kit that we used to electrify the East Coast Main Line. Um, each of the regions, five regions in those days, all had plant departments with masses of plant engineers and support staff. And in fact, the plant departments of British Rail were separated into two divisions. You'd got the m and &E plant, which uh, was rail cranes, etc., and then you'd got the, the civils plant, which was tampers and, uh, and track maintenance machines. Sectorization happened in early 1980s, and we all ended up working for either intercity, regional railways, or, or whoever. And following that, there was the formation of the infrastructure maintenance units. And I worked for the Eastern Infrastructure Maintenance Unit at the time, um, of which there were seven, and there were six track renewals companies created, track renewals units, sorry, created in 1994. Privatization then followed, which included the creation of rail track franchises and the sale of everything else. So we had seven IMUs and six TRUs offered for sale. Existing BR plant was shared amongst the newly formed units and included in the sale. So, as part of the, the sale process, the seven IMUs became infrastructure maintenance companies and the six TRUs became track renewals companies. And a requirement of the railway safety case regulation is required that the successor organisations had a professional head of m and &E, or, or a fleet, in essence. And this meant that the professional heads became the controlling minds in respect of plant and operations in each of those successor companies, which was quite a departure from existing situation where we'd got a whole hierarchy of, uh, of people involved in, in plant operations and plant management. So in other words, the book stopped here. It rested with the professional heads. And gone was the cushion provided by the directors of civil engineering and the director of m and &E and their respective teams. So it was recognized by forming a group of the newly uh, appointed professional heads, we had a group that could come together, could share problems, um, share incidents, and basically adopt the philosophy of a problem shared as a problem halved. Then April, in April 1994, the first ever meeting with the m and &E networking group was held at the Kennedy Hotel in Houston, chaired by me and attended by the 13 professional heads of the new companies. And the individual companies were then either the subject of management buyouts or acquisition by other companies. And I think very quickly, Scotland TRU merged with Western and Northern merged, and we ended up with four out of the original six. So then the changes, what happened post-privatization? So throughout the many changes, including mergers and acquisitions, the m and &E networking group continued with a strong commitment from its members to promote safe working practices with plant, help each other with the incidents and accidents, and freely sharing knowledge to resolve problems. With the express instruction from our individual managing directors that we weren't there to discuss commercial issues, or indeed impair um, competitive advantage. The group also satisfied the requirement for collaboration called for in the railway safety case regulations, and which is still required today under ROGS. And the group recognised that prior to the demise of rail track and the emergence of network rail, no standards existed for the management of OTP or OTM. So we set about rectifying that, 
by creating a series of, of codes of practice. And Mick's going to talk more about the codes of practice as we go on. So recognising this mission we created, the document that you see there, which was a code of practice for operator competence on OTP. Um, over time, um, certainly in network rail terms, that standard is, uh, is no longer required because they've, they've caught up with, with what we were doing and, uh, and they now have their own standards. But these standards are used worldwide um, and I think that's due to um, people taking jobs in Australia and various other parts of the world and taking this knowledge with them, which I think is a, a great, um, great cue for the Mechanical Engineering Networking Group. So, one of the changes that we, uh, we introduced was, we recognised that the management and operation of OTP and OTM is not all about engineering. There's an operation side. So we expanded the group to include the professional heads of operations of the various companies, which of course probably doubled the, the membership of the m and &E. And then, recognising that the industry was changing, there were more companies entering the, the rail market. We expanded um, the, the, the opportunity to join the ME networking group to anybody who had got a railway safety case. So, permanent membership of the group is open to all UK operators of OTMs with mainline safety certificates, UK infrastructure managers, RSSB, ISLG, and RPA. And we regularly now have 25 people at our joint meetings which are held bi-monthly and um, which over the past 20 months has been uh, in a virtual environment. However, last week we had our first face-to-face -face meeting. We've got 25 people around the table and it was a joy to actually be there face-to-face. -face. Felt the meeting was much better, great synergies and uh, so we're not, not, uh, not wanting to uh, move away from the good things that, that has happened since COVID hit us. Our meetings in future are gonna be 50% virtual and 50% physical. Um, we have 14 companies who are permanent members and we regularly see 25 plus attendees at the meeting. And now I'm gonna hand over to Mick. We're gonna talk about COPS and the outputs of the group. Thank you. Uh, as Jack said, uh, one of our most well-known outputs from the M&E meeting is, is our COPS. Um, and one of the questions we're, we're quite regularly asked is, uh, well, where do COPS sit amongst the panoply of, of, of regulations that we, we have to, to comply with? Um, and obviously, starting off with statutory law, you know, Health and Safety at Work Act, etc., 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 um, which we all have to comply with. Working in this industry, railway group standards um, are effectively mandatory. Um, and rail industry standards, um, whilst not completely mandatory, it's mandatory that you do either comply with them or do something the same and tell everybody else what you're doing. So they are on the sort of mandatory side of being um, required. And then there's the voluntary standards, European standards, uh, international ISO standards, and that's where our COPs sit. We're in the, the voluntary section, but uh, a cross-industry uh, agreed standards. And uh, beneath that, we've got uh, guidance notes and then company standards um, to, to comply with. Uh, not exactly mandatory, but of course the reality is that most work is done by contracts and most contracts are mandating standards anyway so the whole lot is, is will comply with this the one thing that all our cops have is that statement there and that's actually quite important to us this it's just saying that it's actually uh, available to anybody it's it's what we've put out there and where there are i wouldn't use the word conflicting because I wouldn't like to think there is conflicting requirements, but where there are uh, parallel or alternative requirements, 
it's the most restrictive or the most uh, onerous requirement that is the one to be complied with. In most cases, that will tend to be company standards, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the COP itself is the more restrictive, so you comply with the most onerous requirement. Why do we have COPs? As Jack said, there was a, a gap in the industry was noted, uh, noticed, and that's where their history, that's where they started. But uh, COPs are required um, as, a, as a reactive basis, and probably the, the, the most classic example, the very sad event at T-Bay um, in 2004, uh, four of our colleagues died as a result of a runaway trailer. Um, at the time, the then fledgling network rail took the only decision they could take, which was to ban the use of trailers until it was understood what happened. So trailers were taken off the track um, with no real understanding of what they were going to do or how they were going to get them back. The M&E group um, produced one of our COPs, a new COP, um, for the safe use of trailers. That was produced in, I think, two weeks. So within two or three weeks of this sad event happening, we had a safe system of work and the industry could get back to work, but get back to work safely, the most important bit. So that was how that, that standard there was, uh, or that code of practice there was uh, produced and, and used. But there's other reasons for wanting uh, COPs. We use them for collaborative working, where it's just sensible for the industry to all do the same thing. And the m &E has produced uh, what we believe to be the best way forward. Um, and there's the one there for any line open working, ALO working, and was actually invited by Network Rail to produce that for them. Um, so that was so that the whole industry was working together doing the same thing. And some COPs were also in the unique position to actually provide that sort of information. And that's especially true with uh, on, tra on track free and OTM driving standards where all those uh, companies are all together in the M&E group and can produce the, the, the joint standards. So we produce a whole variety of, of, of COPs. Um, as Jack said, it started off with, with COP number one on operator competency. Uh, but since then, there's a whole variety of COPs have come in um, and f for a whole different re load of reasons. Mo very often, COPs are produced to say how to do something rather than the what to do, but there are the what to do's in there. And there's also uh, COP125 there, just to, to, as, a, as an example, there's the, site, uh, the siding safety surveys. <laughs> Um, which is, is uh, those are available um, nationally on the RSSB website, so anybody can actually see those surveys. We have 48 current published COPs. There have been others that have come and gone, but at this moment in time, there's 48 published COPs. Those are available on the RSSB website, so they're available to anybody. Anybody can go in there worldwide and as Jack said we are well aware that these cops are being used the other side of the world in Australia um, so these they they're used internationally which is um, very 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 pleasing uh, and the other thing to say about our cops um, is that they've actually been mentioned on more than one occasion in RAID reports as being um, industry best practice, which is something that we're actually very proud about, that, uh, that we're, they are seen to be um, as good as, 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 as RAID require. Um, not only do we publish COPs, we also publish posters, uh, which are just intended to go up on the notice board for a, for a month or two, and just to act as reminders uh, about requirements. They don't in themselves create new requirements, they're just reminders of requirements that exist or things that you should remember, like uh, the one on the right there is the, is the new format for our posters and it's reminding about the leaf full season and driving that a little bit more carefully. So not only 
do we produce uh, uh, outputs in terms of the printed word? But uh, the M&E group, because it's a, a group of uh, um, experienced, um, and I'd like to think knowledgeable people, um, t together the, the Brains Trust is, is uh, very useful for providing an output um, to, to actually be the opinion formers for the um, plant engineering world uh, and plant operation world. Um, we have the membership that Jack described um, from um, infrastructure managers, all the operators, uh, RSSB, uh, co-opted members uh, such as myself, so Plaza UK is, is in there, um, and uh, there's biennial members, so people are, are elected uh, to serve two years to represent constituencies, so the um, PABs, manufacturers, etc. are all in there, in the group. And now we have um, ISLG. We're through a memorandum of understanding between us, the two groups, which actually is quite important because that gives us the route to the, to the top table. The, the leading health and safety on British Railway, um, which is the group facilitated by RSSB, but actually is industry-led, which is the top table for uh, health and safety on Britain's railways. Um, we have that route into it, so we're at the top table. We've also got uh, seats as the M&E on the Rail Plant Association and also on the Train Accident Risk Group, or TARG. And m and &E members are also uh, members of um, RSSB standards committees, the plant, rolling stock and uh, TOM, uh, operations uh, standards committees. And with it being standards committees, there's also the subcommittees of those, so we're into the uh, TSI mirror groups, etc. And there's m and &E membership also on other RSSB working groups or, or uh, system, system interface committees, the vehicle structures and vehicle signalling. And we are, uh, have membership on the uh, international or the SEN working groups, the European Standards Working Groups, uh, particularly for Work Group 5, which is the on track machines, and Work Group 43. Um, and not only national, but also international now. So the ISO group. Um, so there's a new working group for, for ISO, so international standards on track machines. Uh, and we're fortunate enough to be involved in that. And we uh, are also involved with SSWG and uh, RIA. So we've got the, uh, I've sort of rounded the whole industry. So that's where we are now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mick. So what next? Um, as, as Mick has shown, the, 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 the groups that we interface with, and, and one thing that um, probably is not there, is that we are recognised, the M&E group are recognised as the OTM fleet operator nationally. So obviously individual companies can't, there'd be too many uh, people involved in that, so they recognise that the M&E group were best placed to, to represent OTM as an industry. So what next? So the last 27 years have, have seen many changes in the industry following privatisation, lots of new entrants and uh, lots of new, um, new machinery coming on board, innovation as we've already heard today. Uh, and work volumes continue to grow with increased investment in rail infrastructure. Um, not much for us lads up north, I hasten to say, but um, the south are certainly going to benefit from uh, Boris's announcement. Uh, but as an industry, what's worrying is we've seen far too many accidents and incidents involving plant. And I think um, Nick Millington's uh, presentation earlier highlighted that. So the m and &E group are very keen to work with, with Nick and, uh, and, and other groups in the industry to, to try and mitigate that risk. In, in the past, the M&E group's probably been working more in reactive mode than, than proactive mode, and we recognised as a group we wanted to change that. We want to be proactive. So we've basically taken a lead from the, the Leading Health and Safety on Britain's Railways initiative. 
Um, and so we're working on a strategy to set out how railway plant engineering and OTM driver safety and standards can be managed to mitigate that risk. And this complements the work undertaken by ISLG, who Mick's already mentioned. ISLG tend to concentrate on workforce safety, but there's a fine line. And we were conscious that we didn't want anything to fall between the two stools. So we've now got a memorandum of understanding with the ISLG working group. And we, they have representation on our group, we have representation on their group. And if we've got an initiative where the boundaries cross, we decide who's best to lead that, that piece of work. And up to date, that's, that's working quite well. We've, we've had meetings on runaway risk, which is a worrying um, uh, event that seems to be increase, on the increase more and more. I've missed a slide, so I'll just uh, add a little bit. So the need for an integrated plan for safety improvement was identified, which is going through the final stages of checking before its publication. And I was hoping that that might actually uh, reach the RSSB website before I retired, but maybe maybe it will be uh, it'll be January. But um, I think that's a great step forward. And the purpose and intent of the plan is to identify and maintain a common to all risk registers associated with all plant engineering issues. OTM, OTP operations and their interface with infrastructure managers and other transport operators. So we're obviously not just dealing with network rail here. I think Mick men maybe mentioned that uh, part of our group also includes um, TFL. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it's any infrastructure manager and, and the, the group continues to grow. Um, we've just recently um, received uh, uh, an application from Northern Ireland TransLink, um, and they're going to be joining our group. And we had Laram at our first, uh, their first meeting last week. And we're developing a suitable practical risk control measure to address identified risks in a consistent way, leading to continuous improvement of safety performance and management arrangements. And we're developing a performance indicator model to enable continuous review of all positive adverse trends in performance of plant engineering and OTP and OTM. And what we've done is we've, we've formed a risk review group, which is a new subgroup of the m and &E. And one of the big issues we've had in the past is the, the availability of data relating to incidents. We've done a lot of work with Network Rail and TFL on basically getting better information, more reliable information, and, uh, and, and increased volume of information. That's now coming through, and under um, TFL's chairmanship, Jordan Skay, we've got a risk review group that analyzes that data, and that will drive the work that we do in the future on production of COPs and posters with a risk-based risk approach. Thanks for listening.